Okay. So last time we had basically finished up the psychedelic counterculture segment. And I think I'm going to hold off. Oh, no. Let it begin. Um, I think I'm going to hold off on going into the cults portion of things for the time being because I want to possibly work it into a different area this time around instead of just kind of like blowing through it because I think it's really interesting and I'm sure that some of you here are cults buffs as well. Um, so today we are just going to dive directly into counterculture, part one of counterculture. Before we do so, um, real quick, uh, I want to hear some natural sources of 5-MeO-DMT and keeping in mind that one of these might be more obvious than the other and the other was a plant that we discussed last time that contains trace amounts of 5-MeO-DMT that are not sufficient enough to actually cause a five space trip. Does anyone remember what that plant is called? And I see a lot of variations of toad in the chat for the other one, which is correct. Um, so the first one, first naturally occurring source of 5-MeO-DMT that is probably the most prominent that we'd be familiar with was the bufo varius toad, um, el bufo, as it's sometimes referred to, or just toad or toad venom. And this guy has these two little sacs on its cheeks are venom sacs. And the way that this is collected is that you just like gently squeeze the sacs and the liquid comes out and then it crystallizes. Um, there are ways to do this without hurting the toad. Jared, yes, that is correct. I'm very impressed that you remembered that. That's amazing. This is what coming to every drug school class does for you folks is you remember stuff like Yopo. So Yopo is the, the other one that I was thinking of. Um, these are seed pods that contain bufotinin, bufotinin, uh, pronunciation game with Rachel, as well as trace amounts of DMT and 5-MeO-DMT. Keeping in mind that, again, trace amounts are not sufficient enough to cause a psychoactive response. So um, you take notes. I love that. So you have the Colorado River Toad, which is bufo, and then yopo. And um, yeah, just keep in mind that just because something contains a psychoactive substance, it doesn't mean that it contains it in significant enough quantities to be psychoactive. And that also is an important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at stuff like supplement packs is that sometimes supplements will just like, they'll have some of a potentially very useful supplement in them, but there's just nowhere near enough to actually cause a threshold effect. So before taking any new supplements or taking supplements in general, I think it's a, probably a pretty good idea to check the bioavailability of that supplement. You can even use Wikipedia for this. You can just look and see like oral bioavailability, et cetera, average dosing, how well it's absorbed, how it's metabolized. Getting familiar with that kind of thing is pretty useful for being able to tell if you're getting ripped off and buying something that's going to do nothing. Um, magnesium is an excellent example of this. There are so many different kinds of magnesium. They all have different bioavailabilities. And for the most part, I can't, I cannot tell you which the most bioavailable magnesium is anymore. I've forgotten. I think it's magnesium glycinate, but now I'm not sure. Um, I have a feeling that someone's about to in the chat and let me know though, <laughs> possibly. So just like, make sure that you do your research anyway. So difference between phenethylamines and tryptamines. I want to know that, oh, eggplants have nicotine, but not a worthwhile amount. 20 pounds of eggplant is one sig. That's really good to know, I think, if someone's like going through really serious nicotine withdrawal, I'll just roll up with like a massive pile of eggplants and tell them to eat them raw. <laughs> Make eggplant farm. Um, so phenethylamines versus tryptamines. Can someone tell me, anyone tell me, the what I would call the the major significant difference between phenethylamines and tryptamines, either in terms of like which neurotransmitters they resemble most closely, their effects differ. Um, yeah, give me kind of a general set of differences between these two categories of drugs. Phenethylamines versus tryptamines. You can also unmute yourself if you would prefer to. Okay, I see phenethylamines are dopamine related and stimulating and tryptamines are more serotonin related and chill. 
excellent right on so that is generally what i would say is like a pretty easy difference between the two of them is that phenethylamines will probably probably you know there's differences between every individual drug but as a structure of substances phenethylamines are going to be more stimulating than tryptamines so for instance amphetamine is a phenethylamine so is mdma um so is dopamine so is norepinephrine whereas tryptamines include serotonin and serotonin analogs, things that structurally resemble serotonin. And uh, serotonin gets metabolized into melatonin as well. So that might be a pretty easy way to remember that serot serotonergic or like, I don't wanna say serotonergic substances, but tryptamines tend to be a little bit sleepier and more sedating, I would say. It depends on the specific one, but phenethylamines will often give you kind of like a body rush comparatively. Okay, who was the godfather of psychedelics? Shulgin. Yeah, Shulgin. What event was effectively the culmination of 60s counterculture? The peak, the apex event. Yes, you're crushing it, Woodstock. Yes. Uh, who was the Grateful Dead's acid dealer? Made millions of hits of LSD. Owsley, that's right. Oh, you are just shredding today. Um, in what country do giant hallucinogenic <laughs> bears, <laughs> honeybees produce hallucinogenic honey? Nepal, that's right. There's one other country, um, actually do, Malaysia, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know for sure about Malaysia. Um, the two that I'm most familiar with are Nepal and Turkey, but I would not be surprised if you're correct. And that's another area where this, remember it's, it's a rhododendron plant a flowering plant that produces gryonotoxin and it's honey. So these giant honeybees will move the gryonotoxin and produce honey from it. Nectar, not honey. Uh, what's this? The Tura, right on. Okay, the Tura is a significant deliriant approach with extraordinary caution. What is this? Rosemary, Haha. -ha. Gotcha. It's Salvia. You're right. It's Salvia. Um, Salvia is legal. There have been a lot of battles against it being legal that are really funny. Or they're not funny at all, actually. I shouldn't say they're funny, but they're really interesting. Like the legal battles against Salvia have drawn from some really bizarre sources. And Salvia is a delirium and a dissociative. And then what might this be? I'll give you a hint. Oh, yeah, you don't even need a hint. It's, chong it's Changa. So this is a mixture of DMT and an MAOI, it's like a ground up smoking blend that was created approximately 2008 in Portugal at a festival. Okay, now for today, we're gonna to be going into counterculture. And I wanna specify something about counterculture when we talk about this is that what I'm referring to, as opposed to what you might typically consider to be, and we're gonna be talking about a lot more movements than just these, uh, I'm, I'm referring mostly to kind of underground communities that have incorporated drugs or been significantly shaped and formed by drugs. And underground has a lot of different implications and has a lot of different facets that can come along with it. In this particular case, I'm interested in looking at the different ways that drugs have kind of crept into communities that were forced into the shadows in one sh way, shape or form. Because oftentimes the communities that have been the most substantially formed by substances have been those that have been forced to exist on the fringes of society. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And some of it is correlation and some of it is causation. And we'll take a little dig into that at some point in time. But for now, let's lay the groundwork. Starting in the 30s, looking at jazz. Now, I bet that some of you are really surprised to see jazz here. Um, jazz exploded the 30s to the 50s approximately. Um, heroin started entering the scene in jazz communities predominantly black jazz musicians at this point in time, like jazz was black art and remains black art. And um, smoking weed became more popularized during this time. But again, remember that there was this huge pushback against weed in white American communities because of the influx of Mexican immigrants in the tens to twenties. So you have this underground drug use occurring in, in oppressed demographics in the United States. And this was particularly prominent in jazz. But in addition to this, we saw a really substantial amount of alcohol use. In fact, it's been estimated that approximately 450 years of jazz were lost due to cirrhosis of the liver, which is fatty liver from alcoholism. 450 years 
years worth of jazz music was lost during this time period for alcoholism. Um, heroin was a really prominent part of many jazz communities. A lot of economic hardships came along with racist America, obviously social and societal isolation came with racist America, um, as well as the issues of, of um, just like general exhaustion. And this transition and this really interesting, weird congregation of these things where this um, establishment sprung up called the narco farm, I believe in the 50s, I think it was the 50s, maybe it was the 40s. Um, and this was the first treatment center that actually studied addiction instead of being like a, a, a problem of morality as being a disease. This was the introduction of the disease model in terms of actually formally treating addiction. Um, so the interesting thing about this narco farm was it was a prison that had like a bunch of farming territory. And the idea was we'll bring these people here that have a substance use disorder and we will have them farm and that will rehabilitate them. That was the idea. But what ended up happening that was really kind of unexpected was that people would play jazz at the narco farm. And this jazz band of the narco jazz band became so good and had so many of the biggest players in jazz ever that people would voluntarily go to this narco farm rehabilitation center. So you could choose between going to a typical prison or going to the narco farm. And a lot of people voluntarily checked in here, partially because they wanted to play with the greatest jazz players of all time. Now, this was an unsuccessful program, largely, which might surprise some of you because the idea of like rehab through farming and jazz music probably sounds a lot more appealing than our current brutal incarceration system. And it is, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to rehabilitation and actually helping people get out of existing ruts with substance use, if you put them in a new environment where they're able to like thrive and develop, and then you put them exactly back where they came from afterwards, what is going to change? You know, like you are developing a certain amount of, or you're developing certain skills and behavioral patterns in one environment that cannot feasibly transfer to another where basic physical and social needs are not being met. But um, here's a little peek at the narco farm and what the narco farm looks like, because this is a really interesting part of drug history. Hello? Plagued by drug addiction. Out there in front of an institution. We had a softball team that played teams in town. Plus the fact that we had the jazz band. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the jazz world was plagued by drug addiction. Many of the greatest musicians of the time were users, creating a bohemian mystique around taking drugs. Lexington had one of the best bands that you wanted to hear because there was a lot of top-notch, you know, uh, Howard McGee, he was a trumpet player. Benny Green, trombone player. Chet Baker. Some of the greatest players of all time passed through the narco farm. Sonny Rollins, Lee Morgan, Tad Dameron, Stan Levy, Jackie McLean, Red Rodney, Elvin Jones, and many others. It was such a mecca for jazz musicians that some checked themselves in just to play with the masters. They were great jazz musicians, but at the time they were just well, drug addicts, you know. But now, looking back, when you think of them as legends. The narcotic farm itself was becoming legendary. One Lexington band performed on The Tonight Show. The institution was featured in books. Newspapers, magazines, and even Hollywood films. Morton. How was it down there, Frankie? Greatest place you ever see, Francie. He means Lexington. I'm telling you. Ball games, great food. I even learned how to play the drums. Yeah. You make it sound as if I missed something by not going to jail years ago. It's a prison, no? More hospital time. This Dr. Lennox who took care of me down at the hospital. We were a good guy. He told me at least 10 times. He said, Frankie, when you get out of here, you take even one fix, you hooked again. Frank Sinatra's performance in The Man with the Golden Arm was the first widely seen portrayal of the agonies of withdrawal. 
At Lexington, treatment began by gradually easing the patient off narcotics to reduce the pain of withdrawal. There was no kicking cold turkey. Got to make all that poison out of you. But the primary approach to treatment was talk therapy. This is the romantic era of Freud and the notion of the unconscious. And I was certainly uh, taken with this stuff and thought, well, maybe there's somebody who can say the right things. I'll get the right insight. And this difficulty will be over. All of the patients got psychiatric treatment. It was second one. So this is like, you know, you might not expect this. You know, you have, yeah, sorry, one of my spreadsheets <laughs> reared its head. So you might not expect this, right? You have like jazz as being the first point of counterculture. And again, counterculture is not really an appropriate label for jazz culture. Jazz culture is is a culture that was predominantly part of black culture. And so it's it's not counterculture so much as it is culture that has been intentionally oppressed and has a very complicated history and complicated relationship with the rest of white America. Now, um, kind of segue out of this, in the 70s, the Nixon administration started really cracking down on drugs and opened the Addiction Research Center. So we started off with this narco farm that was looking at addiction and substance use problems in a different way than had been looked at before. And then we have this new thing opening up under Nixon. And the idea here is that they would take volunteers who were prisoners, basically, you know, like testing things out on prisoners is a long standing part of American history. And something that we really need to keep in mind when thinking about the fact that the incarceration system is so disproportionately skewed towards black and brown people. And the notion that this testing, these experiments that have been continuously performed on prisoners, on people that had very few rights that were going to be outwardly protected, have been consistently carried out on black and brown people. This is a major issue with vaccine rollout as well. You know, like there is so much mistrust in the medical community. This is a prime example of where that originated from. Um, the Addiction Research Center would intentionally provide the same substances that these volunteers had been working to kick for X number of years, whatever, would intentionally re-addict, which is a word that I don't really like to use, but in the well, just for brevity's sake, re-addict a person to this substance and then intentionally withdraw them, intentionally have them go through physical withdrawal by removing this, this substance from them again. And they would like intentionally give people heroin or something like that in exchange for participating in experiments. Like this was an extraordinarily corrupt system. And it was scandalous. And it is extremely interesting that on drugabuse.gov's website, no part of this program getting shut down is mentioned, no part of them uh, unethically causing re-addiction and intentional withdrawal is mentioned on the website. Now moving kind of into a different sphere of the same general era, this is 1950s to 1960s, the beat generation. Now this is following World War II. This is young people who have just like absolutely gotten so sick of the uptight and like heavily Christian ordeal or, or ethical mindsets of America. And use in New York City, in particular Greenwich Village, which is like known as being a gay central and central for poetry, et cetera, started um, publishing literature about shit that was not allowed to be talked about, basically. This was like the start of this massive tornado of change, wherein people were actually talking about sex and drugs for the first time and holding hedonistic events and parties and doing spoken word poetry fairly often. Um, beats were known for their weird bongo poetry stuff um, and stuff like spoken word in different formats. All his life, he never got fat. He wound up with a used car, a 17 inch screen, and arthritis. Tamari is a drag man, Tamari is a king size bust. <laughs> Now, this is like a revolution in terms of what had been happening previously. Now, the thing about it, though, is that, of course, with any youth movement that seeks to completely upend existing kind of moral trends and moral standards, especially in white America, um, this was very, very unpopular among many people that were older or part of the media or more conservative. So this movement immediately coined this own 
um, word beatniks. And I'm sure some of you have heard beat or beatniks. In fact, the word beat used to mean something different entirely. It, it used to, well, it, beat can be used to mean a lot of different things. It can mean like, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired of doing this. It can mean, um, in, in terms of beatnik, it was actually coined from the word Sputnik because Sputnik was the Russian satellite being sent out for the first time. And the idea was that beatniks were far out. It was the beats and they were far out. Um, and this just had this like horrible, horrible stereotype of these like kind of lazy, stupid, low education people. Um, some of you might be familiar with Top Cat, the boomerang show. Anyone big boomerang fan? Um, and beats were, were depicted in Top Cat. There was this one cat, this guy. I wonder where Dibble is. He should be here with the chop suey by now. <laughs> There's the beat cat. Uh oh. Why, opposite Dibble? You look positively nauseating. Is something wrong? <laughs> hey, look at me, fellas. Like, uh, no hands. So this is like an open character of a beatnik. That's the, that's actually what's being portrayed here as a beatnik with the bongos and the like. This is an early hippie. This is like the first iteration of hippies. Now, in this same exact time period, The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley was being published. And this was kind of what pushed the beatnik era into being interested in Eastern spiritualities like Taoism and Buddhism, which hadn't really been at all popularized in the United States because they were so other. And then this beatnik generation comes in and is like, fuck everything that led us to the point of World War II and everything that is coming thereafter in terms of these roles and these social rigid structures. Um, what can we bring in that is different, that is new? And this, I think, is also a really interesting first indicator point of the difference between cultural appropriation and appreciation and stuff like that, where um, the tendency that white Americans in particular, I know that phrase is getting used a lot today and it will continue to be used, have this, this draw towards absorbing cultures that are different and foreign and seemingly better or more effective than their own while simultaneously acting oppressively towards those who actually own those cultural materials. Um, those two things cannot coincide. They cannot coexist. It's an oxymoron. So there was a lot of xenophobia still happening during the same exact time period where beatniks were absorbing all of this literature and all of this material from Eastern spiritualities. So we start to see this dichotomy of we will absorb this thing while it is for our benefit and we will not extend benefit to those who have actually crafted this thing that we are looking for. Now, in the meantime, we have, uh, sorry. Uh, the chat was down. The opioids tend to reduce creative inhibition similar to how alcohol can. Yes, um, I think generally things that reduce anxiety that reduce intensive ruminatory thought patterns can increase creative expression for a lot of people. I think people have a lot of blocks against doing something wrong that can be lifted with the use of depressants as a creative enhancer. However, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have um, the beats or the beatniks that were instead using amphetamines and amphetamines were just starting to become popular during this period with this benzodrine inhaler which was a brand of amphetamines so this was literally just like you huff it basically and also morphine so these are the two like initial starting points for recreational drug use starting to become a part of like the counterculture white youth revolution in america um was this Nita? Jackson, what do you mean was this Nita? Uh, I was wondering if that was an early precursor of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the Nixon stuff in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say exactly what is considered to be a, like a predecessor to those things because all of them kind of mounted on each other to create what we have now as a system. I'm actually not very familiar with the creation of Nita, partially because I hate them so much that I refuse. Um, but I probably shouldn't, I should probably know, but I don't know really exactly what the, the timeline was for that. So these amphetamine inhalers were, became like a pretty significant part of some beatnik culture. You know, there were, there was like a membership ordeal going on here. Oh, did I? No, I didn't. 
um, a membership going on here. William Burroughs was an author of these two books of Junkie and Naked Lunch. And he was like a very prominent figure in this scene. And then also we just started seeing this like this parabola of like explosive, creative, expressive beatnik behavior that then started kind of tumbling a little bit near the end of this cultural period. But this really did like seamlessly transition into the beginning of the hippie era. So keep in mind we're on the East Coast right now. You have jazz all over the country. Now, during this period of time, this concept of hedonism was introduced into society. And if you're not familiar with hedonism, it is basically life as a search of pleasure. So beats were really the ones that started actually introducing this concept into mainstream society and, and, and actively pursuing it. So this was like very much centered around concepts of rejecting the establishment and doing drugs, talking in, about and having sex. Um, most of the time, the drug use that was kind of like pushed more outwardly by the B generation would be more in the realm of psychedelics like mescaline or mushrooms, um, but also amphetamines and opioids were a part of this. So keep in mind that the major drugs we're seeing right now are mescaline or, or are um, naturally occurring hallucinogens and amphetamines and opioids like morphine. Um, yes, sorry. So this is what I was saying earlier about beat originally meaning burned out. Um, like I'm beat, man, I'm exhausted from the system. And then it became kind of like shifted into expressing freedom against the system. Like this is beat and out. Now here we are kind of clashing in. You remember the merry pranksters and the further bus from last time that's on the West Coast. You have the beat Nicks on the East Coast. And here I am zipping these two things together. It is all interconnected. Now, what I find really interesting about this time period is that very similar revolutions were happening on both coasts at the same time. And remember, there wasn't the same kind of connectivity between coasts that there is now. So the fact that this was happening relatively simultaneously in different ways, I think is a really important indicator of how much unrest there was after World War II among younger populations that were like, fuck this, who are not interested in this happening. So one of the major players here was Neil Cassidy, who we mentioned last time as one of the drivers of the further bus. And he was one of the guys who started as a beatnik and then eventually drove the further bus. You know, it was like this melding of these two worlds. And this very famous beat book called On the Road that you should really read if you're interested in this time that details the adventures of the further bus and how it goes back and forth across the country and how the merry pranksters hung out with the hell's angels and all kinds of shit like we'll talk about the hell's angels and the merry pranksters a little bit today um but this guy in particular i think that's ken kesey is there and this is neil cassidy i forget which is which so these are these two like huge players that are bringing the west and east coast together just like trailing psychedelia and mayhem in their wake back and forth between the coasts now across the pond again we're now in Europe, in the same Europe. <laughs> never said it like that, and I'll never say it again like that. Now we're here in the UK. And a very similar cultural revolution is happening at the same time. Now, it's funny, right? Like we have East Coast USA, West Coast USA, UK. This is all post-World War II era, and the youths are on the up and up. So in 1958, the mods came out. You guys might have heard of the mods and the rockers. So the mods were like basically Vespa bros, which I think is super funny in retrospect. Like, you got your scooters and your amphetamines and shit. Um, and there was an economic boom that meant that there were jobs and youths could um, just like work and make money to party. But then there was only the weekend party. So partying was wild at this point in time. But remember that partying now is very different than partying then. So this started as like jazz clubbing and then jazz started evolving partially in response to the drug use of these two groups. Like the music that was getting played in clubs started changing in response to the desires of those that attended them. So this was the start of this massive moral panic in the UK because they would butt heads with the rockers who were like the bike greasers. Um, there were specific clubs that were catered towards mods. Remember Vespa bros are mods. And one of them was like the marquee. And this was like jazz and blues music, et cetera. The Twisted Wheel in London, I believe was a really famous one. And the reason that amphetamine became really popular in these areas was because a lot of clubs didn't have liquor licenses. 
you couldn't get alcohol inside. So this thing called a purple heart became very popularized. It was a mixture of barbiturates, which is like um, early first generation high side effect benzos mixed with um, amphetamine. And this combination was called a purple heart. And it basically encouraged a speedier crowd, encouraged a speedier audience because previously alcohol was the drug of choice, but these kids were basically like, oh, amphetamine, actually I can like go for much longer and I feel more sociable and I'm less likely to be hung over from amphetamine. And this was pretty directly in response to the fact that we didn't have liquor licenses in clubs, which is something that we'll see in the US when we talk um, very soon about quaaludes and, and discotheques in the United States. Now here we have the greasers, the, which are the rockers, the biker kids versus the mods, which are the scooter boys that put, I guess, all that's kind of tight, honestly, I would totally ride that. Um, and this ultimately led to the Battle of Brighton Beach in 1964, which I think is so funny. Like this is just one of the most hilarious products of like weird drug history ever, is that this video is also really funny. I just imagine the Benny Hill theme song. <laughs> So we start out on the beach and the mods and the rockers just start beating the shit out of each other on this beach. And everyone's like, oh no, people, the kids are fighting, it's because of the amphetamines. And this just like, this moral panic over these like youth groups gone wild, just spreads like wildfire. And of course, what is the defining factor that is really easy to take control of? This battle right be so and they like beat each other with beach umbrellas sometimes. There are a lot of arrests. You know, it's like pretty wild. Um so I'm catching up. So this was again like a, an easy representation of how it's really a lot easier to criminalize drugs when there are groups that you want to quell, whose activities you want to quell. You need an excuse to arrest people. And I know that at first glance, that might sound kind of like a hand wavy, generalized explanation for why drugs are illegal, that kind of stuff. But you have to realize that during these time periods, this kind of threat to the existing status and structure of different social areas was really monumental. You know, like you don't have social media to track people down. At a certain point, law enforcement kind of started relying more heavily on this notion that they would be able to extract information from people, to extract compliance from people on the basis of having something to search them for, having something to fuck them over with. And this isn't speculation. This is just like good politics, basically. So just jumping back across the pond again, I just want to throw that in there as an example of what's happening in the meantime. So keep in mind the 50s was a big amphetamine and mescaline time. Those two substances were really growing in popularity in multiple regions of the world at that time, amphetamine and mescaline, as well as morphine. And you'll see why that's important, or actually, no, you won't. I'll tell you why that's important. If you look at the international treaties that have been um, released around drugs, the one in 1961, the single narcotic or single convention on narcotic drugs specifically targeted amphetamine-like drugs, um, I forget what the other ones were, but I think it's opium-like drugs, cocaine-like, no, cocaine-like drugs came later, but they specifically targeted the drugs that were really prevalent during that time. And we initially saw this like kind of smaller batch of substances that needed to be targeted by this convention. And as a result of that targeting, different drugs in those classes started coming out. So every time a new convention happened, it would be the same general idea of which drugs, but more of them in different varieties in different areas. As a result of prohibition on a global scale, the number of drugs that needed to be controlled went up by a lot. Just saying, just as an example. So, um, Man, it really just messed up all my formatting. This really frustrates me. I should have gone and fixed this. So the Hells Angels and the West Coast, just going back across the pond. Um, the Hells Angels are one of the biggest biker gangs in America. They will outwardly state everywhere that they're just guys who like bikes. You know, they don't they don't make meth or whatever. But you can make meth and like bikes at the same time, which is what the Hells Angels do. And the reason that I know this is because a friend of a friend actually used to tour with the Hells Angels and has confirmed that this is actually the case and has confirmed as well that I've mentioned this before, the reason that meth was called crank was because Hell's Angels would store them in the crankcase of the motorcycle, would store meth in the crankcase of the motorcycle. Um, 
Now, the Hells Angels are notorious for a lot of reasons. There is a lot of history of violent crime among Hells Angels. Um, they have kind of a record of being accused of, with a fair amount of validity, having meth labs in Los Angeles and California, um, as well as being cocaine distributors. However, apparently they're pretty outwardly vocal about disliking heroin and crack, which is kind of like really funny, to be honest. Now, this time period, this is the weirdest party ever. The, the Merry Pranksters, those hippie dudes that drove that crazy bus across the country, were like, okay, Hells Angels, we're going to write you a letter and invite you to a party. And the Hells Angels were like, oh, it's like, a, like um, entangled when they go to that like bar um, and it's like the ugly duckling bar and they go inside of it and um, this princess is like, haven't you ever had a dream to all of these really gruff like barbaric dudes sitting in this angry bar and this huge guy looks up and is like I had a dream once and it's kind of like that with the hell's angels and the merry pranksters because the hell's angels were like uh <laughs> I guess and then they rolled up to this party which was a banger and at this point in time everything they were doing was legal so there were cops around the perimeter of this crazy acid party and people were doing acid outwardly like the hell's angels and the merry pranksters outwardly um, if I remember correctly, they actually sang a weird song about the Hells Angels, which really threw them off, and they were kind of like, haha, vibe check. Um, but an interesting thing also to keep in mind about this party was that there were multiple sexual assaults that were reported here, like pretty grievous ones. And I think something that people forget about the psychedelic community and about other communities that are woke in one way, shape, or form. And I don't use the word woke lightly because I think that people over apply it to anyone that is interested in being nice to people. Um, but in this particular case, I think it's important to keep in mind that while we talk about all of these communities that have revolutionized the way that we view freedom and the way that we view affection and the way that we view interpersonal connectedness, people get trampled in the meantime. This is still a predominantly white, a predominantly cishet male situation, and it always has been. So don't forget that. Don't forget that in this, again, both of these pictures, all white men in these photos, um, the psychedelic movement was dominated by men, and there was a lot of misogyny in it, and there continues to be a lot of misogyny in it. So just like something to keep in mind, because the majority of people who report using psychedelics are white men between the ages of like 25 and 35. Um, especially if you fall under this category and you're watching this or you're in this class right now, just keep in mind that if psychedelics feel like this mind expanding, mind opening experience to you, that's fantastic. But these spaces are super inaccessible to most people still, super inaccessible. Like the subset of people that can access this kind of thing is incredibly limited. And it is not a like sacrament, you know, like th this space is still very unsafe for a lot of people that occupy it. Just because you do psychedelics does not mean that you're a good person. Hitler liked psychedelics, if I remember. <laughs> Um, now for the Rainbow Gathering. Rainbow Gathering is one that I could get into. <laughs> I know a couple of the Rainbow organizers, um, not on a close basis. The Rainbow Gathering started in the 70s, and this was like the tail end of hippie culture. So we had like post-World War II, we had beatnik culture married with the, the Merry Pranksters and the West Coast, bam, blah, blah, blah. Um, amphetamines and morphine and mescaline and mushrooms starting to really enter the scene. Weed started re-entering the scene. We had this swell of hippie culture in the 60s that carried all the way through to the start of the 70s when it started really dwindling at the start of the 70s after the Vietnam War was over. And after the, the war on drugs began, things really started changing. So this was kind of like the big final shift of hippie culture was the start of the rainbow gathering, which is a completely decentralized thing. Um, there are gatherings all over the world. The idea is like Rainbow Land. It's a place for uh, hosting or annual gatherings. There are no leaders. It's just volunteers to organize. It's a gathering. It's just a gathering of people like coming together to celebrate connection, basically. Um, recently, there have been some murders in the Rainbow Family gatherings. However, this is something that is like, I'm not going to comment too much on because the fact of the matter is that whenever you're hosting a large gathering, there isn't really much of a way to fully vet everyone that's coming, especially if your gathering is very much predicated upon sharing and gifting. There will be people that take advantage of this. It's true. That's just how it's going to be. 
Um, and again, the, the larger your community gets, the more drugs will be a part of it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good or a bad thing. Um, it just kind of further reflects the need for safer drug use and education. However, um, oh, I want to read up on this right now. <laughs> oh, there's so much here. I see stuff about the Hell's Angels. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's not that much glamour to a lot of this stuff. How vulnerable. Yep. <laughs> Was this the birth of books? funny. Yes, I didn't say that though. Now, the, the other issue with the rainbow gathering is, I think I'm friends with this guy on Facebook, um, is that there have been a lot of, of accusations of cultural appropriation, unsurprisingly. And in fact, there was a cease and desist issued by, uh, I forget which tribe it was, I should have which tribe it was in here about um, using ceremonies and traditions, also issues with just like a ton of people showing up in an event and like they're not being sufficient hygiene and waste removal services, people that have like rolled up to hospitals and not paid the bills afterwards. Again, I wanna really just like emphasize, this is a small subset of a population that otherwise really does just like want to host peaceful communal gatherings. Unfortunately, with no centralized leadership, there comes the issue of there being very little accountability. And that's something that we see a lot of in party environments is especially in the realm of sexual assault and consent is that there's very little accountability a lot of the time. Like people cannot be held liable for causing harm at things. It's important to keep in mind. Okay, now, oh yeah, there's lots of cultural appropriation in the side trans scene. There's lots of cultural appropriation in party scenes in general and lots of people that have no desire to admit it and who will get very belligerent in response to it. The Burning Man community, I can say is a long, long time burner is particularly, particularly guilty of this. Like burners are either really good about it or so bad, like even worse than your average layperson a lot of the time, which is very sad. Now we're in the seventies. So enter methacolone, which is, Quaaludes, it's Quaaludes. And right now actually we're seeing an interesting resurgence of uh, Quaalude analogs on the market right now. One of which is SQL 164, I believe. And that sounds like, like, a, like a barcode on R2D2, but it's generally kind of like an, an interesting new trend on the market that people are having a resurgence of interest in methacolone analogs and recreating this experience because Quaaludes completely disappeared. I think after the 90s, they were like totally gone. They are a little bit comparable, I would say, to general effects to benzos and GHB. Um, they have a potential, I should, I did not edit this slide, that's my bad. Um, they have the potential to be rewarding and reinforcing, so there is a potential to develop problematic use patterns with methacolone. Um, in terms of the physical dependence issue, like that is a thing really is what I would get at is like these, these can cause physical dependence. Um, it was really easy to get lewds in the 70s and 80s without a prescription. And they were known as disco biscuits because again, there were lots of clubs that didn't have liquor licenses. So quaaludes became very popular, especially for sex. Um, I read a really fantastic experience reports about quaaludes one time where this guy and his wife were going to a wedding that was like 40 minutes away or something. And it took them four hours to get there because they both took quaaludes before leaving and stopped to have sex so many times that they didn't arrive until like the wedding was almost over. <laughs> now enter discotheques during this era. We are moving out of the hippie era, out of the rainbow gathering era and into the start of what will eventually become formulated as the modern rave. Yes, we are there, baby. So disco, the rising genre, um, in the 70s, discotheques just went crazy with popularity. You have this motion of clubs going from jazz to blues to faster music, and now disco is entering the scene. There, there's a, a, a radical shift in what people are listening to, or like, there's like a rock in between there, obviously. You know, you have Woodstock and everything, right? Not to leave out rock, Hendrix. P.S. The likelihood that Hendrix actually soaked his bandana in LSD is like zero. Why would you do that? Like, why would you do that? That's the biggest waste of acid ever. Unless it was just like, 
like why would you i don't know just put it in your face you could put it anywhere in your face your forehead that's like the only place you want to actually absorb on your face <laughs> sure it drips in your eyes in your mouth that sucks <laughs> sounds really uncomfortable so what a lot of people don't realize about the start of club culture about the start of raves and partying in this way is that discotheques originated as a safe haven for oppressed populations again this needs to be updated i'm sorry i should have come i didn't think we would get this far i should have combed through these to make sure they were okay um particularly like gay populations black populations latino populations and this was like very different than what had been offered before like these clubs were a safe place and that's part of why when people get really up in arms about the the knowledge that I don't remember the exact statistics off the top of my head, something like 87 or no, it's more than that, something like 90 something percent of headliners at festivals are white. Now, I can and will and in some detail go into the histories of various rave genres and how uh, it was often like black gay artists that came up with the music that is currently raking in billions of dollars in the entertainment industry right now. Um, so the fact that those are completely underrepresented populations in dance music means one of two things. The first is that they're not good at what they do. They're not talented. The second is that the system is racist. <laughs> there are There is no other way around this concept. Like if a population's music is not being appreciated or supported in the mainstream. It either means that it's really bad and they can't make any of it or that something is really wrong. Um, this is outwardly racist, this one. This is acknowledging systemic racism as, as existing. You decide. Um, oh yes, there is a story about Hendrix leaving the stage because of a rough acid trip, yes. Um, yes, we will talk about the different origins of music. We'll talk about all kinds of stuff. So this was like also an interesting segue into Studio 54, which is a classic example. Studio 54 and the, and the Limelight. Some of you might be familiar with these two clubs. Um, I'll just show you a little bit about Studio 54. When you walk through those blacked out doors, you are in another world. Andy Warhol, Calvin Klein, Elizabeth Taylor, Mick Jagger. It was hot, sexy. It's like an adult amusement park. It is so preposterous. People came from Brooklyn. They had this understanding that they were getting out and they were going to do something big together. We want to be the ultimate nightclub. Beautiful models, celebrities with gay men, transgenders, and it all started blending. A world fantasy that absolutely exploded. Sex was in the air. There were mattresses in the basement. The amount of drugs was profound. Everyone felt like they had to be there. The people started to get angry because they couldn't get it. You can't have this much popularity without somebody wanting to take it down. All of a sudden, the lights were on, the police were there. It was like the reality was in your face. The basement had bags of cash and drugs. The feds, mafia, the White House. They definitely mess with the wrong people. Controversy was like a moth to a flame and it got even bigger. I actually haven't seen the documentary yet and that was my roommate who just came in and didn't realize that I wasn't muted and wanted to talk to me about her thesis. And uh, so I don't know if you guys could hear me over here. Um, but this documentary, oh no, did they really get rid of the videos here? This is a really excellent article about this, but basically Studio 54 was this massive scandal um this extremely popular nightclub where uh there was just this like complete explosion there was you know there were like ledgers detailing the drugs that were bought and sold in the establishment there was fraud it was just this crazy crazy counterculture revolution happening inside of this club and in addition to this there were like mattresses in the basement for sex and stuff like that like this this club was wild and then moving on to the, the limelight we'll get to in a little bit any of you guys really into club kids any of you like done a lot of research on club kids in the past any of you familiar with Club Kids? Oh, really? 
oh, okay, I'm about to blow your mind then. Let's talk about club kids maybe next time. <laughs> Get it on. Um, so now we're moving into cocaine culture and coke culture is like a really, really prominent ex or example of how racially segregated Americans ability to do drugs in comfort has always been. So here we are. Um, Boogie Nights, I believe, was set in the 80s. And then, of course, you have the Pulp Fiction scene where she ODs. Do I remember correctly that that was actually heroin and she thought it was coke? Is that, yeah, that's what it was. Right, so these were two movies that really put the American preoccupation with cocaine on the front lines during this time period. Now, initially in the 70s and 80s, there was this massive resurgence of interest in cocaine and coke had lain fairly dormant for a while because of um, this like heavy stigmatization of black people using cocaine. Um, in fact, in the early 1900s, there was an article that I've mentioned before published by the New York Times about cocaine fiends, black cocaine fiends. Uh, the actual word that was used is not mine to speak. And um, this article was just like very widely representative of this American idea that black people would become fiends on cocaine that would rape your wives was the thing that was like always the argument was protect your white women, they will be raped. Um, and the thing about that is that that has been like an argument, like white women have held so much social power since the beginning of time in terms of race dynamics. Like white women have had the ability to basically justify extraordinary racial violence with false claims against people of color. Um, the Tears of the White Woman is a really interesting article that was written about this a while ago about how powerful the like pouty, fearful behavior of white women has been in terms of like justifying violence against those that they dislike. Now, there's a reason for this. Um, there's a reason that cocaine resurged in part and became popular among affluent white partiers. Again, here's the basement of either Studio 54 or the Limelight. I can't remember which one. Um, there's the swimming pool with the fish and the Barbie. This actually looks like a great time to me, as well as mattresses in the basements, right? Um, and then you have Coke on briefcases. But the reason that this, this became so prevalent during this time was actually that there was an economic crisis in Peru. And in response, farmers started cultivating coca in mass crops again. And then Cuban cartels started getting in on this very lucrative business. Um, we'll talk exactly about how that happened. There was a really bizarre handoff between a CIA agent and the, the cartels that basically allowed cartels to fly um, cocaine onto this tiny little island strip that allowed them to, that was like neutral territory between the US and I believe Cuba that would allow them to like swap planes really quickly and then go into the US without being searched. And that was how a lot of coke started entering through Florida. Um, Florida is like a hub for cocaine entry in the United States. We'll talk about cartels. We'll look at like Griselda Blanco and other cartel ringleaders soon. Um, but this was the, the time period where it became very economically prosperous and, and profitable to start producing and moving cocaine. And people just had no idea that coke could be dangerous. It was like completely off people's radars until people started dying from it. I think there was actually a high profile baseball player maybe who died from cocaine use and everyone was like, oh, uh oh. And then movies like Boogie Nights came out that start off with this really lighthearted thing and then becomes like a warning against cocaine. So just, um, oh yeah, Cocaine Cowboys is about that as well. Um, uh, Yes. Sorry, I'm reading up lots of important stuff in here. Um, 
so the thing the thing about raving and racism is that what I've seen as a white person in rave community in a lot of different rave communities like spanning the spectrum is that the longer I as a white person have been in the scene the more I've borne witness to behind the scenes covert and overt racism from other white ravers um I've witnessed this in the form of people speaking just like amongst themselves in groups and in private messages um, I've witnessed this in how like groups of certain ravers are referred to but I think the main thing that I've witnessed that I think has been the most um, problematic and maybe the most subtle comparatively is that many ravers are in complete denial that racism could possibly exist in their scene. And that's really where a huge part of the issue comes in. Um, yeah, lots of transphobia at raves too. Lots of transphobia, lots of homophobia, um, lots of physical violence against trans and gay people at raves. Um, there was actually a poll that was taken that showed that something like 60% of gay and trans folks had experienced physical violence at raves, seriously. Um, and yeah, there, there aren't that many black ravers comparatively. And it's not my place to say exactly why. I have quite a few theories and I have heard quite a few direct um, sentiments expressed by my friends who are black ravers who have spoken about this, but it's not my place, I would say, to really speak those words. There's lots of literature available about this on the internet. Read from the source, listen to the source. Um, don't snort white powder you find in someone else's jacket. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, oh, we'll talk about immigration and the war on drugs as well. And the fact that ICE has a quota for deportation and that the majority of it is for drugs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so club drugs, just to reiterate, this is the last thing that we'll go over for the day. Um, these are the major things that are considered to be club drugs, right? Drugs that are specifically used and associated with party environments, raves, clubs, etc., what have you. Nitrous, MDMA, quaaludes used to be the case, but no longer, but they were like very clubby as a substance. Um, or like hot tub sex, you know, pick your poison, por que no los dos. And then ketamine as well um, is definitely rising a lot in popularity. Poppers are very popular in some scenes, particularly gay communities. We will come back to talking about poppers in gay communities later when we talk about chem sex and methadrone and stuff like that in a little bit. We'll go into like all kinds of the like real niches of these things. Um, cocaine and amphetamines. These are generally, I would say, what I would consider to be the main family of club drugs, so to speak. And then next time we will go into raves. Okay, looks like there's a lot in the chat. So I'm actually gonna keep the recording on right now so I can keep, or so I can respond to these things. Um, so in response to the question about homophobia at raves. Um, so here's the thing is that I think that a lot of this depends on which communities specifically you are in. There are some communities and some subsets of communities that are extremely welcoming of um, LGBTQ plus identities. There are some communities that are extremely conservative compared to what you would expect. Mainstream EDM events, EDC for instance, um, there's actually a pretty large population of gay men that attend EDC, but trans folks have a very different experience at a lot of these events. Um, it is not normalized to introduce yourself with your pronouns. It is not normalized to be able to express a trans identity in spaces in general, in particular in party spaces. So my recommendation for all of you, every one of you, is to get in the habit of introducing yourself with your pronouns, especially if you are cis, especially if you are cis. If you introduce yourself to someone and say, my name is Rachel, I use she, her pronouns, it immediately opens the door for that person to be like, okay, I can say whatever my pronouns are to this person. This is an invitation from this person. Um, most people will really bulk at introducing this into their lives. 
The reason I recommend it so strongly is because this is something that my college is very liberal, you know, like I'm very fortunate, extremely privileged to be in this environment, but every single person at my entire college, faculty, staff members, professors, every one of them introduces themselves with their pronouns, has it in their email signature, and it works so flawlessly that no one here thinks twice. Like everyone introduces themselves with their pronouns and it is just like so totally normalized. It is just like the easiest thing in the universe. Um, in fact, I highly recommend like if you're in a Zoom, if you're in a chat, change your name to be like your name and your pronouns. If you're cis in particular, this is powerful. I guarantee it will feel really weird if you're not used to it, especially if you're in an environment where people are not going to take to it in a friendly way. But I assure you that even if you just are like to one, I've had it happen many times where I've been like, I'm Rachel, you, she, her. And the other person will look at me and be like, what did you just say? Like, I don't know what words came out of your mouth. And I'll have to do the awkward thing and be like, oh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm just introducing my pronouns. It's uncomfortable at first. Sometimes people just don't get it. And then you get used to it. <laughs> so like this minor lifestyle change might seem totally foreign to you, but I guarantee you will be astonished at how many people introduce themselves with pronouns that you're not expecting. And they probably never would have mentioned it on their own. So open that space. You can be a part of a really positive change here. Um, being involved in drug education, being involved in harm reduction means reducing harm, not only for those who are the most privileged. We have a responsibility to advocate for the health and safety of all people especially for those that do not have access to resources through systemic injustices, LGBTQ, trans folks in particular, um, and, and especially people of color. Like we have a responsibility to directly advocate for everyone that is suffering from inequity right now. So keep this as a part of your drug education practice. It's all interconnected. As you can see from jazz and heroin in black communities, as you can see from injustices and in how black communities and prison populations are disproportionately impacted by prison testing. Um, as you can see by how trans communities are not welcome in rave culture, even though rave culture began as a refuge and a safe haven for oppressed demographics in the United States. These things are completely interconnected. Don't forget about it. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to stop recording. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes and otherwise have a great night.